investments, discuss um, alternative investments and one particular alternative investment class, which is the international investment space. And uh, essentially, one of the cultural values for us at Vested has been grow together. And that means not only for our employees, do we want uh, them to grow, but also for our investors or our user base, uh, we want to give them the opportunity to grow along with us as a company. And in that spirit, we launched this series, which is called uh, Think Like a, a Global Investor. And uh, essentially it's meant to, to share knowledge on how one should look at the global markets. As they say, the more you share knowledge, the more you get. And, and so and that's why we, we essentially started this series. And today for the, the second episode of Think Like a Global Investor, we have a very special guest, Mr. Shrikant Ayangar. And um, before I get into his introduction, a couple of a quick housekeeping items. First, the agenda for today is we will go through some um, quick introductions uh, generally about the alternative investment space and um, Mr. Ayangar. And then we will go, go into a presentation by him, uh, after which we, uh, we will have a short Q&A where uh, there are some questions uh, that, that I will post to him and then we will open, up, open it up to, to audience Q&A. And so if you have any questions, please drop them in the, the Q&A section underneath. Uh, it will help keep it organized rather than posting it on the chat. So uh, please do do that. And one more thing. So uh, both of us, Mr. Shrikant and and uh, and Vested uh, and me, because of regulations, uh, cannot give any advice. So all the content that we cover in this series is meant for inf informational purposes only and is not to be considered advice. Great. So with... All of that done, let me get into uh, telling you a little bit about Mr. Shrikant. So he started his career in the capital markets at NSC about 20 years ago. Uh, he was a member of the core group that set up the equity derivatives platform in India. Post that, he was involved in risk consulting for global financial firms across New York and Singapore. Uh, later in India, he set up and managed multi-strategy proprietary funds at Edelweiss Capital, Sher Khan, and Motilal Oswal. Currently, at Five Capital Services, he's uh, managing an absolute return fund with superior risk characteristics across the India and the US markets. So that's a quick introduction about Mr. Shikant. And um, just to start off, uh, Mr. Shikant, I, I have a, a question for you. So. Um, you've had a long and, and illustrious career. Can you tell us a little bit about how you eventually made your way to, to becoming a managing, a managing partner at Five Capital? Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, essentially, uh, I was fortunate enough to start the derivatives market in India. Uh, so uh, along with National Stock Exchange uh, way back in the earlier 2000s. And... Uh, Post-2001, when uh, National Stock Exchange opened up uh, for trading for members, uh, I was uh, involved with uh, essentially only managing proprietary funds uh, for, as you said, Edelweiss, uh, then with Sher Khan, and then with Motilal Oswal. Um, so, till, uh, so from 2001 to 2014, uh, I was essentially managing uh, money through a proprietary methodology of a multi-strategy fund, which was focused on, uh, or which was focused on absolute returns on uh, the proprietary capital of these uh, companies, and then later on, uh, from 2014 onwards, I started out on my own uh, firm uh, called Five Capital Services, essentially again managing funds. Uh, so I have been only all I've done is manage funds, uh, <laughs> and. Uh, uh, I use both the equities derivatives market uh, and uh, the equities market, as well as the commodities market sometimes. Uh, so, so, uh, but kind of commodities market, I just restrain it to uh, uh, the precious metal segment and uh, some of the metals which are traded at LME. So essentially only uh, restricting commodities trading to international commodities. Uh, so that's that's a broad uh, that's a broad uh, 
stuff that I've done over the years. Awesome, thank you. That's uh, it's great to hear about. And and so from from quite some time ago, in fact, I read an interview that you did in 2010. Um, when you talked about U.S. investing and generally alternative assets, so so you've been a proponent of alternative alternative asset investment since quite some time. Uh, could you, to start us off, just tell us a little bit about what what are alternative investments and um, what kind of alternative investments could one consider? Yeah, uh, so in India, see uh, see the way it is played out is the first part of the decade, which is 2000 to 2010. It was more of a, a super bull run that India witnessed. And somewhere after 2008 uh, till now, uh, what you have seen is uh, essentially the uh, indices being flat on a US dollar term. So, there, so the search for yield somewhere began in 2010 onwards. Uh, so after 2010, uh, people, uh, I mean, most of the investors started searching for yields and uh, we didn't have good yields available in the equities market vis-a-vis -vis the risks that they were taking. So that's how uh, alternative investments as a space came in. And within alternative investments, you have real estate, you have commodities, you have precious metals, you, has, uh, you have a geographical investing, uh, which is essentially US-based investing. And uh, so all of those has come in during this decade. So it is more of a decadal phenomenon which has happened. And... Uh, we have seen uh, that as the investors have found that their yields are getting shrunk, uh, they have they have explored a lot of a uh, lot of areas uh, within these uh, aspects like commodities. Commodity derivatives also incidentally happened somewhere in the earlier part of the decade, and uh, then uh, all of these products also came into uh, came into fruition, and uh, people started. Uh, wanting to expand their yields uh, using some of these products. We also saw a structured product boom uh, during this decade. Uh, most of those were focused towards, as I said, uh, if you see that uh, is somewhere in 2007 the, or somewhere in early 2008, January 2008, the Sensex was around 21,000. Currently, as we speak today, it is 37,000. So you have seen virtually around 12 years of uh, uh, no returns or very, very minimal kind of returns uh, on a rupee term also. And on a US dollar term, you are actually on a negative uh, basis. So we have seen the rupee actually depreciate from around 40 to close to 75, which is close to around 90% uh, depreciation over the last 12 years. Got it. And, and, and I think that has played a key role in... Uh in essentially alternative investments becoming popular, right? And and one of the, the big ones has been geographic diversification. I think that's a one that we have spoken about a lot and kind of that's how the, the idea for, for Vested was born as well. And uh, I think this is a good segue for us to, to jump into what you have for us uh, in terms of how we should be thinking about international investing. And, uh, and, and, and uh, if you can share um, sort of whatever um, information you have uh, via this this slides, that would be great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Just start off. Uh, uh, we just start off on the slides. Uh, we, we have named the uh, the session as tackling home bias through the lens of a novice. The novice is obviously me, and uh, tackling home bias is essentially uh, essentially one thing which most of the investors find it very difficult to kind of. Uh, uh, conquer because at the end of the day where you are born and brought up and you are, where you have invested that is a place that you are more familiar with and uh, since familiarity uh, uh, is, is a key aspect in investing uh, investors really don't look beyond the home country so there is a huge home bias uh, what we have tried to do within this uh, session and within this slide pack is uh, essentially try and uh, point out what are the key myths, what are the key realities uh, in investing in a U.S. market, and how do you really view a U.S. market? What has happened so far, and uh, what is what is kind of slated? Uh, I hope uh, the slide is there. Uh, we are on the second yes. slide. Yes, yes. So, uh, so this is the investable universe broadly. Uh, you have an asset class which is equities, bonds, currencies, properties, and commodities. Uh, so what happened in between 2010 to 20, which is this decade, is uh, since uh, most of the investors started to search for yields, most of the money got locked up into property, 
between 2009 to 2013 a huge portion of money which uh, which was a investable asset uh, since there was not much of yield being offered in any other current asset classes a lot of money got locked up into properties uh, they were not clear on uh, looking at they, they were kind of oblivious to the fact that they can also expand through uh, emerging markets or through developed markets so none of those uh, geographical expansion is something that uh, they were looking at only over the course of last two years or one year uh, have we seen some uh, some interest in uh, expanding their portfolio into a geographical universe and now most of the most mostly it is a recommendation that since we have seen a rupee depreciation of close to 90% over the last decade uh, most of the people most of the wealth advisors kind of recommend having at least 10% uh, exposure towards uh, geographical expansion and uh, more so because uh, you can you can actually see that uh, the gold price during this time which also is a composition of basic metal which is the gold price itself and the rupee dollar movement a lot of lot of uh, uh, gains that you see in gold which is from 2009 to now i think gold has moved up from 9000 to 50000 on a 10 gram basis so lot of stuff that you see is because of primarily the rupee depreciation that you saw so so that is something that uh, people have been cognizant of now having said it uh, within the equities i think uh, these are the four five sectors which are the most prominent ones technology consumers and financials world over it is not only an indian phenomenon world over uh, most of the money uh, which has been made by investors is in the top 3 sectors which is either in technology either in consumers or either in financials so these are the three hot sectors now we have seen the fourth uh, emerging healthcare is is uh, kind of emerging as a uh, key sector to watch out for cyclicals have always been a kind of uh, uh, more of uh, metal investing mining and uh, metal and mining companies and manufacturing is essentially oriented towards the infrastructure development of the country again in developed markets you have seen that infrastructure development is uh, is already played its role most of the developing markets and emerging markets have a lot of role in this aspect so let's let's first step on to the history of uh, how what is the market so how, and why uh, us has kind of gained a lot of prominence over the last decade and most of the investors are kind of rushing to invest into usa and uh, most of the uh, investors are wanting to look at us market in way back 100 years back 120 years back this was the structure of the market it was fairly well divided uh, between us uk germany france most of the european countries uh, you had the australias and south africas again india was still not independent so uh, it was a part of the uk but uh, so it was a it was a well divided market and over the years what we have seen is uh, this is what has happened and why why international investing is kind of gaining a lot of prominence is because if you see over the last decade again uh, or probably last 20 years you have seen 70% of the gdp growth is coming out of the emerging markets uh, and only 23% was attributed because of the market capitalization a good chunk of it is uh, all other markets which is uh, most of the developed markets are in the developed markets uh, us is close to 55% of the world market capitalization the world market capitalization of around 80 trillion uh, close to around 55% is us and there is a emerging market tax uh, which gets heavily le levied in form of uh, the discount that you get for the emerging market investors like Ch india china and uh, a lot of other countries including some south american countries uh, uh, they they form a part of the emerging market bus why uh, why us funds uh, this is a one this is one question I, what i have tried to do is most of the presentation is addressing uh, several questions so that whatever questions uh, comes down into the minds of the investors Uh, those are the questions i have tried to kind of capture and address so why uh, us is the pied piper and why us is the mother of all markets and why um, the sensex and nifty and any of the global markets follow the us essentially if you see the entire fund assets domicile 
nearly close to 50% of all fund assets which are domiciled all over the world is US. Uh, Luxembourg again is again eight to eight, eight to around nine percent. So so essentially US po forms a, a portion of close to around fifty five percent of the entire fund flow into the entire markets, and that's where uh, you see that uh, US is the pipe piper for most of the markets. And everyone has to look at what what the S and P is doing or what the Dow is doing before deciding on their investment decisions. Way uh, in any part of the world, more so in India also. So what's happened in US so far? Uh, so if you if you really see that uh, it is a big bull market in bonds, uh, which started off way back in 1982. So if you see from 1980, and that's a that's a huge market. Uh, that's like a 38 year market, and that's a huge market, multiples of equity market. The bull market started way back in 1982 when uh, the actual bull market started for so equities also. But it has not gained a lot of prominence in this, in terms of your normal dialogues, uh, because uh, because equities are more sexier form of investing, well, uh, uh, and bonds are not. But if you really see the long term bond fund uh, from uh, over the last twenty years has done much better than the long term equity total U.S. market stock market. So so. It's been a bull market for uh, for U.S. and it is a secular bull market. So you could, yeah, this kind of a trend of 38 years of the yields dropping from 15 percent, which was which was what was the yield uh, way back in 1982, uh, to close to less than a, less than one percent now, has seen that the long-term bond fund has has performed as you say 375 percent versus the U.S. stock market, which is only given around 235 percent, but in your mind space, you you still attribute a lot of uh, focus onto the U.S. stock market because, again, because those are the companies that you are kind of encountering on a daily basis. You use the Apple phone, you uh, you see uh, uh, Amazon uh, actually Amazon are delivering you stuff. So, so that's why uh, U.S. markets have kind of gained a lot of uh, prominence. But if you really again look down and uh, break it down into smaller parts. Uh, you have a look at this where uh, the the MSCI All Country Index, uh, which is what uh, we should be concerned about sitting here in India, uh, for the last 13 years has not done anything and probably has ended up in negative ter territory. So in the last 10 years, what you have seen is only one one market which is kind of beaten the bushes for everyone, which is like a S&P 500, which is kind of rocketed from a base number of 100 to around 230 so and out of which also if you if you again break it down further in the second graph uh, that you see uh, you see that the s&p 500x the farm stocks which is essentially facebook apple alphabet amazon netflix and microsoft uh, they again are in the negative so over the last 10 to 12 years you have you have really seen the stock markets all over the world not really performing most of the companies are finding it difficult to uh, drive their earnings. Uh, the earnings has been flat in India for the last six, seven years. And uh, and a good part of the world also, not that uh, India has been uh, one exclusion, but uh, a good part of the world also, we have not been, we have not seen any uh, earnings increase except for the fan stocks. The Only the fan stocks are kind of appearing to you and uh, uh, are there in most of the conversations because most of them are now a trillion dollar kind of a stock, and that's where uh, it has gained a lot of popularity or investment. So it so it has gained a lot of mind space over the last couple of years uh, because of the fan stocks. If you again break it down, uh, S and P 500. If you see top 10 uh, stock, they are they are the ones which have given you the year to date positive return, and top 10 are essentially technology stocks. Uh, top 50 has been broadly flat, rest everything is negative. So as you see the winner takes all, uh, winner takes all phenomenon is at work. In the, so this is, this is the bane of capitalism where uh, uh, the entire profits of uh, the enterprises are concentrated in the hands of very few. And top 10 to top 50, it is the same again the world over. Even in India it is uh, similar, but 
uh, on the S&P 500 also, where 500 good companies are supposedly there, uh, even there you have seen the top 10 actually are the only performers in the in the markets. Uh, this is a chart of one of my friends, Rohit. Uh, I think uh, this this clearly explains itself that uh, Nasdaq's. If you see again uh, in the U.S. market, if you break it down, there is a Wilshire 5000 index, uh, uh, which is a broadly a, a broad-based index of 5000 stocks, and you have NYSE index, you have the bank index. So if you see again, it is only the Nasdaq which is working now, and uh, a lot of attention is only towards the Nasdaq. So when you talk about international investing, unfortunately, people uh, really relate it only to the technology exposure because that is something that you don't get anywhere else. And uh, you have the Apple and Facebooks and Amazons of the world, but they are the only guys who have been performing in US. Uh, and the, over the last 20 years, what you have unfortunately seen is uh, the growth stocks uh, have been the uh, uh, have been the only performers, and most of the growth is purely tech based. Uh, this so this again is a uh, is what has happened so far. Like if you see what is the world value versus growth, uh, most of the investing over the last twenty years or over the last two decades have been essentially oriented towards growth form of investing. Value has again eroded. Even Warren Buffet or Berkshire Hathaway has not really been able to beat the index. Uh, and you have seen over the last 20 years. So 20 years is a long period for even uh, Warren Buffet to kind of underperform. But uh, but that's what has been happening. So it's both. Uh, it's it's a it's a report of what has happened so far, and it also presents an opportunity graph, which is if you were to get into U.S. market or into international investing, then value. It is. It's very good and uh, very important to realize that value as a form of investing is at the rock bottom, and probably over the last 50 years, uh, we are seeing value is at the lowest level. So that so and mostly when you when you spot such an opportunity, the best the best form of investment is something that you can do is get into the value space, uh, which is where uh, most of the gains might you might encounter in the coming decade. What I, see, see, currently when you are talking about 2020, you have already seen the growth stocks and everything outperforming. So currently, if you are going to go and buy, say, Amazon at $3,000, uh, then uh, your growth, your growth, which is linked to Amazon stock, is only going to happen post $3,000. What has happened so far, you are, you are only a bystander and a watcher. So you should not, you should not really think about uh, I just want to dispel the myth that uh, do, uh, when you talk about investing into international markets, uh, let's not purely focus on uh, the growth, uh, uh, the technology stocks, because somewhere in people's mind, international investing is oriented towards technology investing. There are opportunities across the space and there are uh, opportunities like value and all. If, uh, the, the graph that I'm showing you uh, it's it's a 50 year low so this is a this is the best time for you to get into value investing into us again uh, this is an, this is another graph which actually tells you how how overpriced uh, some of those microsoft apple amazon alphabet and facebook are uh, even in 2000 which was which was one of the biggest bull markets that you saw in the shortest possible time between 97 and 2000 uh, the, the kind of valuations that uh, came through for most of the technology companies is something that uh, we are still to see. Uh, so uh, right now you are getting mired by the fact that these five companies are kind of capturing a good part of the value. But if you see, uh, micro, uh, they are now at more than 23% of concentration over the five stocks. So, so what it means is to, when you are buying into S&P 500, uh, these five stocks really take a quarter of your returns. I mean, you are you are betting on for a quarter of your. If you are putting in five hundred dollars, hundred and twenty-five dollars is linked to these five stocks because twenty-five percent of the entire S and P five hundred is essentially oriented towards these five stocks. And see the kind of uh, uh, overvaluation which has happened and uh, the concentration that has happened in these five stocks. 
so this is uh, this is an interesting one which uh, uh, which you could choose to follow which is right from 1900s uh, uh, if you really map it out on the us stock market uh, the good part about the us stock market is you have data all the way back to 1875 so uh, when i do a lot of data crunching a good part, a good thing is that you uh, right from 1875 to now which is like 150 year uh, data analysis uh you have you have a stronger chance of finding out good forms of trends good forms of uh, what is the kind of value and all this is done by asman john asman he is uh, and uh, the, the the purple line that you see uh, is essentially what he says is the fair value of s&p 500 and if you see right from 1920 onwards uh, which is close to 100 years this purple line has never been breached uh, so it is a fair value it currently stands at around 1200 to 1300 snp doesn't mean that it will come there because the fair value can keep on increasing uh, uh, as the years roll by uh, so uh, but uh, but yes i mean that it it shows you again uh, the form of overvaluation which is there in the uh, markets normally you see most of the times the fair value is kind of the market comes and uh, touches the fair value at one point in time uh, we are still to see it happening over the last 20 years Uh, let's see when uh, it may after the global financial crisis we have still to see it happening so coming to uh, coming to the current uh, current times which is uh, the covid uh, recession and recession fears which are doing the rounds so this is again 150 200 years history of uh, recessions which has happened in the uh, us markets and uh, as you can see the length of uh, the recessions have been shortening over the last uh, 50 years or so uh, and uh, it's been averaging close to around uh, 11 to 15 months uh, and uh, probably this recession if it is started out somewhere in january 2020 will also average uh, close to around 11 to 15 months which is bit anywhere between uh, november to march 2021 uh, you would see uh, probably the recession fears subsiding and coming off uh, this is one interesting graph uh, which is the average age of s&p 500 in the us uh, this again uh, tells you the mind space that is kind of the average age when uh, 19 uh, during 1960s was close to around 50 60 years now it is close to around 15 18 years so it's it's kind of uh, uh, within 15 to 18 years uh, the company dies its own death uh because that's the, that's the pace of innovation that's the pace of uh, uh new technologies which is kind of coming in and uh, most of the times you would not see a company lasting beyond 15 to 18 years i didn't get that could you try so uh, so this is the black swan uh, it's kind of uh, happened in a very fast manner uh, this is the fastest uh, fall as well as the fastest rise as uh, mr trump himself keeps on saying it in various channels so what is worked uh, in the covid times is uh, something of technology uh, so th this graph tells you what has worked wh which industries are kind of doing uh, better off uh, during uh, covid times uh, most of them are uh, healthcare uh, you have seen telecoms you have personal and household goods technology obviously has been uh, one of the bigger ones utilities again uh, they are kind of getting back into fashion in within us and they are getting into the investment space now after having a, a bad run over the last uh, 15 years and you see retail being a more of a, a straight forward or a more of a straight line uh, business so this is something that we have never seen we have seen it i think it is a it's worthwhile to have a look at it again uh, no one could have imagined or no one could have thought that the oil which is the biggest commodity on Uh, the planet uh, saw a negative price of thirty-seven dollars. So it's it's a it's something which uh, uh, which is kind of uh, something that you just note it down because you might not be able to see it again. <laughs> so and uh, so what will happen in uh, again in COVID times? This is a broad uh, how how the economic recovery will happen within uh, different sectors. Most of the sectors which are kind of highly impacted as real estate infrastructure travel tourism automotive as most of the guys will already be aware of 
this is a very interesting graph i think uh, this is a 20 year return of the s&p 500 as you can see over the last 20 years the s&p 500 20 year rolling return has been positioned down so you are seeing the S&P. See, S&P 500 is not really given you a good amount of return. Way back in 2000, it was around 1400 levels. Now it is close to around 3000 levels. So over 20 years, it's just managed to do a little more than double, which is less than a 5% CAGR. So, so but, but yes, I mean, within S&P 500, uh, these five to six companies have kind of gathered a lot of attention and have. Uh, have been able to become giants of uh, more than a trillion dollars each. So, uh, but yes, I mean, this is one interesting stuff because it broadly tells you uh, that uh, somewhere around 2021, 2022, uh, the markets might kind of bottom out and we might see the revival of the US stock market. Over the last 20 years, uh, we have seen most of the S&P 500 uh, falling off. So. So where is India placed within all of this? Uh, this is Mothilal Oswal's uh, graph, uh, which I just wanted to tell you that uh, we are now seeing the earnings yield uh, at a very, very high level. Uh, again, uh, it had spiked earlier to 1.5 times. Uh, uh, whether it can spike again is anybody's guess, but, uh, uh, but yes, I mean, it is coming out to be a value bet uh, even within India. Since this is a year of uh, presidential, it's good to know what, what the US presidential uh, election years have always done uh, so far. So this, this, uh, this graph tells you a very good thing that uh, if an incumbent party loses, you'll see a big crash coming in. Uh, whereas uh, if, it, if it wins, you'll see uh, the trajectory actually continuing forward. Now, uh, that again is a is anybody's guess as to whether Trump or Biden is going to win. Uh, let's see. Uh, right now, it seems to be evenly positioned. Uh, this uh, so this is one space which has gathered a lot of attention over the last two years, and uh, this is one space where I feel that India has a right to win because. Uh, India is only one amongst the three or four countries uh, which are into the space uh, tech. Uh, and uh, ISRO has a huge name for itself. We have been able to do the Mars mission very well. Uh, we have gained a lot of international attention on the international space. Uh, this. So there is, uh, even within India, I mean, this is a, this is a, uh, this is a market map of uh, what are now with uh, SpaceX actually been able to do a successful start I think this space is something that can explode and can become a huge future industry for India, which can be even as big as the tech industry. So just to put, put it in perspective, let, let me tell you the tech industry is something over the last 25 years, what India has given to the world is tech, technology industry. The tech industry is close to around $170 billion of market uh, exports. And uh, if you really, and that is actually equal to what Saudi Arabia exports, uh, Saudi Arabia exports $170 billion of oil to the world. So it's a, it's a huge stuff, uh, which has helped the Indian industry. We need a couple of more horses, uh, which will take us through uh, over the next, over this decade. I think this, this area is a, is a good watch to uh, keep an eye on. Uh, there'll be a lot of action in, within the tech space and uh, within the space tech and uh, we can actually play a huge role in uh, providing the ancillaries uh, to the space tech market in this. What is the current state of the world? Yeah, this is an interesting one. The, uh, this, this is what, if, I mean, if people are wondering who, who are the, these guys or the, these two oldies, one is the, on, the, on one side is Socrates, on one side is Plato. Now, why did I put, put this up? This is what is happening currently in the state of the world. Because uh, if you see Socrates embodied open society and Plato embodied, Plato was the student of Socrates and he was also one of the most uh, famous as well as one of the most liked students of Socrates. But philosophically, uh, he took a opposing position to Socrates open society framework. And uh, Socrates had a huge this for close society. 
So currently what we are seeing in the world is very, very similar to what has been happening all along in the world over the last 5,000 years. Uh, the society gets divided between open society and closed society. Socrates and Plato are the two embodiments of that. Socrates was a huge proponent of the open society and Plato was a huge proponent of the closed society. Now what we are seeing again with China and Russia being the closed society formats and the rest of the world being the open society formats. So having said all that, uh, this is one thing that uh, you got to uh, have a very strong watch on. See, this is how the countries have kind of shifted over the last uh, 30 years. Now, uh, if you see India in 2024 is going to be the third largest economy. So you are sitting in the land of opportunities. Uh, currently, as we are speaking, uh, there is no better land of opportunity because when these moves happen, like when China came into the top three, uh, in 2000, between 2000 and 2008, the Chinese market, the Chinese GDP, the Chinese prosperity and the Chinese uh, market cap, all of that exploded. Uh, whether this decade it is going to happen for India, uh, let's see. But yeah, I mean, India has a huge chance that uh, we'll see the market cap exploding. We'll see prosperity coming in. In the coming decade between 2020 and 2030, India will be one of amongst the forefront. And uh, you should always, uh, as I, as as uh, most of most of the people would be Indians, uh, uh, you would have a huge portion of your wealth uh, sitting in India, and I think that's a that's a very good place is what I want to uh, tell you uh, before I end. And uh, U.S. obviously, if you want to keep uh, as an international hedge, uh, U.S. is a very good space again uh, to invest. Uh, if you really see China and the U.S. tech, since most of you are aware, this is one fact that I'll tell you that uh, U.S. tech, you are mostly you are following the Nasdaq, but China's own Nasdaq has done much much better than U.S. tech. So, so which comprises of Alibaba, Tencent, and Baidu, lot of stuff. So, uh, so just 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 as a statistic, uh, it's good to know. And finally, I think uh, this is something that I live by and I also want every one of you to uh, imbibe in, uh, within yourself. See, at the end of the day, within your life of around 30 years of work, you will only, you will, wherever your heart is, you will find your treasure. So don't go beyond your heart. Whatever your heart says is going to happen. Uh, you better follow your heart. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shrikant. That was great. I think through the, the language of charts, you conveyed a lot of messages and uh, very succinctly a, a, a bunch of different um, uh, topics that you covered. And so thanks a lot for that. I think uh, I have a, a couple of questions. I also sort of keep mixing in uh, questions from that we have from the audience and uh, would love to get your thoughts on, on some of these things. So uh, one of the first things that I wanted to understand. So, uh, basically, you mentioned that the next next um, sort of few years will be great for India. Uh, then, how how should one look at um, allocating to international equities? That sort of you also don't want to completely um, bias yourself or with the home bias that you mentioned earlier. Uh, is is there any? Uh, do you have any thoughts on how? And then I have a follow up to that uh, as well. See, home bias, uh, see, see the, the home bias is true for everyone in this world. Uh, so, uh, so essentially, if you're an American, you will always like to invest mostly 75% of your wealth into America. Very few uh, outside the America. But most of these companies that has kind of mushroomed and have gained a lot of prominence have more than 50% of their revenues coming out of spaces other than America, like Facebook, Apple, uh, Netflix, all of them are gaining nearly 50% of the entire revenues is coming out of America. So, so they have kind of diversified through that route uh, by creating global brands, which have kind of attracted a lot of attention in the world. And uh, uh, coming back to your question, you should definitely stick to your home bias. This is nothing to do with uh, not investing in India because investing in India, you will be much more better off because you will put your money where you know of the land which you are aware of and the and the businesses that you can understand feel it 
feel and touch and uh, so so good part of chunk is going to be always there but what is in favor of international investing is as a uh, you uh, there are a lot of stuff which is not available in india like the technology stuff like the space startups like a couple of defense startups like a couple of defense companies which are all, all of them are kind of involved so you got to be choosy and you got to be picky when you are investing into us and go into us with a with a intention that that will you are getting into areas which are kind of not available within india and uh, it is kind of giving you a good exposure uh, or of diversification as well as stick to the basic objective of it has to make you the returns now that is the first, that is the first thing in favor of international investing the second is uh, we have a warped policy uh, unfortunately with regards to rupee depreciation so we have seen rupee depreciating around 80 90% uh, over the last decade as i said and that's kind of uh, that's kind of irritating uh, to say the least because when you see uh, most of the central banks even the us fed now having a balance sheet of 7 trillion dollars they are printing money like crazy and you are still following a policy of rupee depreciation so somewhere until the point in time where india gets its policy actions right uh, you got to have international exposure got it and and say somebody has decided okay uh, you want to have international exposure uh, there are essentially two type of investors and somebody one who is more the more knowledgeable investor who does their research and kind of picks certain sectors or certain companies as you mentioned what about for somebody who say might not have the time or the uh, financial know how to be able to pick companies is there sort of a, uh, a something that you would say they should follow in terms of investing internationally while still having the geographic diversification but also yeah uh, yeah most yeah. mostly when you go international uh, since you would not really know the names of the companies and you would not have the time to kind of research deeply then uh, the best way to go is etf route the second best way to go is through uh, what you have also created a basket kind of west and all that uh, so uh, so uh, so have a portfolio kind of an approach where you are kind of taking a 10 to 15 kind of stock uh, a minimum uh, 15 stocks in your within your portfolio in your international exposure because uh, uh, those companies are highly susceptible to earning flaws and uh, both sitting here you will really not be able to know what is happening in the ground correct yeah now that is a very valid point and that's what i'm um, sort of we also educate in terms of the risk is you shouldn't be um sort of enamored by these brands and put all your money in it take a more prudent approach to to investing if you're diversifying yeah great got it so uh, i'll just pick some questions from the audience uh, neha had a question in terms of how, how do you go about identifying non tech growth stocks uh, can we pick any from any russell index that that you'd suggest yeah russell index see there are a lot of indices within the us and uh, as i said uh, when you are when you are thinking about non tech stocks first try and uh, identify which is the sector that you really want to get into and whether that sector is available within your own country uh, and uh, you might once you do that analysis then you would figure out that if it is available within your own country you might be probably uh, more be- better off investing within your own country but if it is not available like space technology or defense or uh, some of the technology stocks some of the e-commerce stocks so uh, first hone down on the sector and then try and identify the leader now try and go uh, try and invest with the leader most of the uh, because in a capitalistic framework the leader takes the winner takes all uh, as you have already seen it playing out over the last decade uh, so so it's best to stick with the leader understood got it and um, so another sort of um, question that came up was uh, in some of these sectors they might not be this so for example space companies might not be listed Uh, do you think private investing is something that is uh, going to be interesting especially as companies stay private for longer with the capital available yeah uh, my my suggestion is don't add too much of comp- complexity private investing has its own uh, own challenges own uh, difficulties so uh, and there are a lot of space technology companies even available within the us which are listed uh, primarily they are ancillary providers and all that so you could you could identify within that basket 
but not really get into a, a private investment unless you know the uh, founder or the person or uh, stuff because private investing has its own challenges and own uh, opportunity curve okay understood uh, there there was a question from mr nitin uh, with regards to sort of the corporate governance issue um, with companies in india and i think his question is none of our technology companies are are product based so how do you see the indian technology sector going forward or do you prefer us technology stocks over indian ones i think you don't need to give advice but just generally uh, your view on the technology sector well we are we are just seeing the birth of the uh, product based company which is coming like in form of reliance geo and stuff so so hopefully uh, it it reliance geo at least its stated ambition is to uh, follow on the lines of uh, becoming a amazon alibaba and uh, uh, google rolled into one uh, so so let's well, let's see and watch how this kind of plays out uh with regards to product spaces yes definitely that is a that's a space which is very very difficult to kind of address in the indian market and uh, to have a globally a globally successful technology product you need to invest a lot into r&d uh, you have a r&d budget amongst the fang stocks which i was talking about uh, they have a r&d budget cumulatively of around 30 30 billion dollars only in the first quarter so over mm-hmm. the last quarter you have a r&d budget of 30 billion dollars between google facebook amazon and uh, stuff so unless you are, you are able to see we are a capital starved country at the end of the day let, let's remember that india is a capital starved country uh, we will we will uh, so so product product space is a very difficult space for you to crack see yeah. got it uh, i think this question has been uh, sort of in the mind of a lot of people especially given the current kind of leadership in the us and uh, you see the the sort of the global market cap leadership of the us being sustainable over the the long run uh, no 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 i don't see uh, personally if you are asking again with all the uh, necessary disclosures uh, uh, with so i don't want to get into any problem with the regulators but at a broad level whether it is going to sustain i really don't think so because as i showed you in a lot of graphs uh, we are we are at the top end now what happens is the balloon is already flying at a very very high level altitude so whether it can go a lot more yes it can go a little more but it is definitely going to pop i think uh, somewhere in this year or somewhere uh, post the elections uh, we might see uh, a rebalancing happening okay. understood i got it um and 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 so you suggested sort of a more um index based approach right if you're if you're more of a passive investor however the the index sort of um that everybody looks at is the s&p 500 and there's definitely flaws with it given the high concentration risk right uh, is how how does how does one look at index investing should they uh, balance it out across say stocks bonds gold and take advantage of all the etfs that are available uh well uh, i think index investing within the us space uh, there are a lot of etfs which are both leveraged etfs and specialized etfs like biotech etfs like uh, sectoral etfs are there so if you want to uh, go on a sectoral basis you can go there or else uh, the best way is to do a broad based bucket unless, because uh, let's let's be clear that you are stepping into a unknown territory Uh, as a as a as a indian stepping into investing into exactly so it is best to go with the uh, broader based index which is the snp 500 okay got it and um, do you have any thoughts around sort of how one can uh, uh, have set their return expectations as well as sort of how one should think about um, wealth allocation in the us is there kind of a range of percentage that Uh, one might think of uh, we, uh, see i am broadly a equities oriented person so i am not the right person to really answer that uh, so i would like to always look at equities in the at a broad level and if you are able to make uh, double digit returns in us in uh, dollar terms uh, then uh, then that's a that's a pretty good return like it stands up to 15% kind of annualized return in indian rupee terms assuming a 3% to 4% kind of a depreciation rate uh, for the inr versus dollar 
Got it. And, and in terms of percentage of wealth allocation, I think you mentioned in the beginning, people typically look at 10 to 15%. Uh, and I think that's also what the US portfolio, US retail portfolios have 10 to 15% international exposure. Is that a good range to think of? Yeah, I think that is a, that's, that's close to around one by eight or 12 and a half uh, percent is one by eight. So I think between 10 and 15% is the maximum that you should go. 15% should be the maximum. We should go into international uh, territory. Uh, again, I mean, they, you, within India, you can only go for a quarter million dollars. Uh, so according to RBI regulations, we have our, uh, our regulations in control as to you can invest a maximum of a quarter million dollars in US. Correct. Um, great. And and uh, one of the other things about the US markets is there are a lot of ETFs available that allow you to invest into other markets, right? You can invest into China, for example, or a bunch of different geographies. Is that something that one can look at through the markets, essentially owning a, a, a more global portfolio? See, US is a market where all the markets in the world are listed. So you can actually use the US uh, platform or the US markets, primarily all the listed markets, including you can own stocks in Russia, you can own stocks in Brazil, you can have the China as uh, you have a Chinese ETF, you have a Brazilian ETF. So yes, I mean, as long as you want to kind of uh, the widen your widen your horizon and bet within a set of markets, you can do it within using uh, US. Even you have an India ETF sitting in US. So, Correct. Uh, yeah. so, so yeah, I mean, so you can you can do it. But at a broad level, the best is was what you understand you do. Because in this business, return of capital is more important than return on capital. Uh, so, so <laughs> that's, that's a good quote. So, so please, uh, first, uh, please first uh, kind of imbibe within yourself that return of capital is more important than return on capital. So, uh, the best is to get into territories which you can kind of understand. Makes sense. And um, so one of the things that um, Vishnu asked was, uh, you mentioned S&P 500 value stocks. And um, are there any sectors that one can look at in, in the value space that might be interesting? Yeah, utilities is gaining a lot of attention. So utilities is one space that you can uh, have a look at it. I think uh, uh, that is one space which is, and as I said, utilities and healthcare uh, has been gaining a lot of prominence over the last, uh, uh, post this COVID, uh, these two spaces are gaining a lot of prominence uh, other than the technology space. Okay, understood. And let me see if there are any other uh, questions. There are some questions related to vested. Uh, those we can answer offline. I think uh, I'll, I'll reserve it to uh, questions for Mr. Mr. Shikant. Yeah. And uh, there's one question on China as, as a general uh, sort of question. With, with the wind blowing against them, do you still see them as number two by 2024? Uh, well, see, it's it's not a it's not a uh, it's it's uh, it's something that uh, if all of us survive, uh, then uh, definitely you cannot really. China is a 15 trillion dollar kind of a market uh, next to the U.S. Now, I don't see uh, why China cannot be number two. Uh, going forward for the entire century. So, if Got not, it. yeah, a lot of people asked asked for the presentation actually. So, I think uh, the the charts conveyed the message very well. Yeah, and uh, so so I think uh, the last couple of questions. Uh, one from my end, which I wanted to know was uh, apart from equities, of course, are there any other alternative assets that one can look at in the U.S. or is it too risky? for somebody to, to go international and then also look at alternative assets? I don't think so. Because at the first, going international itself is a difficult step uh, because you need to uh, uh, factor in a lot of variables like the US dollar uh, movement. What is the currency uh, movement going to be like for the next five years? Uh, and uh, we are already at 75 to a dollar. So from here, whether we are going to depreciate or whether we'll get our handle on the policy actions and probably start depreciating against the dollar. Again, the DXY index is at a top uh, at a top level. Uh, so which is the which is the relative strength of US dollar against all other currencies. 
the second uh, the other factor is fed already has a 7 trillion dollar kind of a balance sheet uh, and it is still growing so so there are a lot of unanswered questions when you are just going into us so uh, so so it's best to stick to what you understand rather than so all of all of these are unanswered questions most of it even most of the bigger biggies or most of the big guys in us itself uh, don't know about so uh, getting into some other form of investment is is extremely risky got it and i, I think one last question uh, is in terms of trends for the the international uh, bond or currency market i think currency is very broad but just on on the bonds market you you mentioned there was a massive bull run over the last a few years do you have any thoughts on what's next so we are we are already seeing a sub 1% kind of a, a bond yield uh, and as i showed you the bond rates uh, in us are less than 1% most of europe is negative territory most of europe is minus 1% or minus 2% so it's a, it's a very difficult call whether we are going to really bottom out or as uh, ray dalio the founder of bridgewater associate uh, he says if, that uh, we might see a beautiful deleveraging and we might see uh, the fed kind of doing a very very soft landing over the next 4 5 years so bond rates can uh, remain low for a longer period of time than uh, what we think so now this is something that we have already experienced in this decade a lot of people who have lost their shirts uh, calling for a, a bond uh, a bond bear market uh, because uh, Uh, right from 2013 onwards people have been betting on a bond bear market and most of them have got their uh, bets wrong so i think uh, over the next 4 5 years still uh, with this coordinated action of most of the central banks uh, they can still maintain the bond rates at a low, much much lower level understood actually i we take one more question from from amay uh, because of the the massive injection that's been happening into the markets um because of the the entire stimulus what what impact do you think that would have on um, the the us market specifically well we have already seen the liquidity gush which has happened and uh, most of most of the gains that you have already seen is uh, a good reason a uh, good one reason is the liquidity gush uh, that's already there now how does this play out really i don't have my handle on and probably i am not the right guy i also do my readings to try and figure this out uh, i am not a, i don't have an handle on how it will going to play out got it great i think that brings us to the end and uh, thank you so much mr shikant this was amazing i learned a lot and um, for everybody who asked for the presentation we will check with uh, mr shikant if that is shareable uh, if not then we will definitely at least share the the recording and uh, thank you thank you mr shikan for taking the time out on a friday evening thank you everybody for attending for all the questions as well i uh, hope this was an opportunity for for everyone to grow together that's that's one of the goals for us via this series and uh, take care and and stay safe thanks a lot and good luck to all of you thank you thanks